Isaiah 14, 12. The scripture says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cast, cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations, with the exclamation mark, which is a declaration. It's a uh, profound statement because it has to do with the fall of something that is far greater than verse number four, the king of Babylon. And so if you're reading a commentary or listening to someone and they say this is the king of Babylon they're talking about in the 14th chapter of the book of Isaiah, if you want to waste your time listening to them, you can. Or if you want to get a little deeper into it, you'll understand that many times in the Bible God addresses a human being but speaks far past that individual to something that is much, much, much more profound than any king of Babylon. The king of Babylon was here and he's gone, but Lucifer's still around. Now the word Lucifer is translation of the Hebrew word Hillel. The Hebrew word Hillel only shows up one time in the whole Old Testament, just once. And it's here in Isaiah chapter number 14, verse 12. That's instructive in itself because the word means a shining thing or a bright thing. But there's a lot of controversy about the exact meaning of the word. A lot of Hebrew words are like this. Sometimes a Hebrew word can mean light on one side and dark on the other. And, uh, can, mean, and can mean light, for example, light, and then sorrow and remorse, depending on the context of how it's used. So you've got to be careful when you're handling Hebrew words. And here in Isaiah chapter number 14, verse 12, the Hebrew word Hillel is translated Lucifer. Now, this word shows up for the first time in the Latin Vulgate of Jerome. It's called Jerome's Latin Vulgate. Now, it's not the old Latin, but it's Jerome's Latin. And, of course, it comes under a lot of criticism, and rightly so, for a lot of things. But it doesn't necessarily mean everything in it's wrong. And when you find the truth, well, the truth is the truth if the devil says it. And uh, that's the bottom line. The truth is the truth. Uh, the demon says, we know who thou art, the Holy One of God. Is that true? Right. Absolutely. It came from the mouth of a demon. But anyway, in Isaiah 14, 12, we have Lucifer. So he used the word Lucifer to translate Hillel. The word Lucifer is a Latin word, Latin, and Latin was, uh, they say, now, you know, you'd have to dig into, a linguist would know this. They say that the word, that, that the Latin language essentially did not exist at the time of the writing of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was written 700 years before Christ, 700 years. And so uh, it didn't even exist. And uh, the word uh, Lucifer is a Latin term, and the word means, Lucifer means in Latin, light bearer. That's important, just kind of tuck that away in the back of your mind for a few minutes because you'll see how it begins to tie in as we get further in this lesson today. Light bearer. One who bears the light. So intrinsically, the word Lucifer really doesn't, uh, is not a bad word in the sense it was used in Latin. It meant light bearer. For example, phosphorus. Phosphor in, in Latin means light or a bright thing. And this, when, we has, we, when you see phosphorus burn, what have you got? You've got a light. It's a burning. Anyway, a lot of things in these languages are carried over into English. This is why English is absolutely, without question, far and be of and beyond the largest vocabulary of any language that has ever existed on the face of the earth. English is the granddaddy of all of them because we got everything in the English language. And you get an unabridged English dictionary, it's going to be that thick. And the reason for that, because you're going to have every word in the English language. So how do we deal with this? We've got Lucifer here in Isaiah chapter number 14, verse number 12, which is a translation of Hillel. Now, the word Hillel is translated in the so-called Septuagint, and many of you, I've told you before what the Septuagint is, the fifth column of Origins Hexapla. It is, a, uh, it is, a, it is a, a, a source of authority that is appealed to many times for changing the translation of the King James Bible and this and that and so forth and so on. But anyway, it's translated entirely differently. It's translated as a shining star, morning star, something like that, or a bright body in the heavens. And the reason for that is because they want to get away from Lucifer. 
the whole idea is to let's get away from Lucifer. We've got Lucifer over here. Let's not malign Lucifer. And you're going to find out in a little while as we get deeper into this thing how much Lucifer is defended by so many different people and groups of people, even those who are preaching from the pulpits. Now, when I say Lucifer to you this morning, what immediately comes to your mind? Satan. All right. So here's the, here's the scenario. The idea is that, well, Lucifer was used in Isaiah 14, 12, but it was used erroneously by Jerome. And the early church fathers connected, Jer connected Lucifer with the statement that Christ made when he said, I saw somebody as lightning fall from heaven. Who was that? Satan. Satan. I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So the church fathers thought, well, Jerome translated Hillel as Lucifer. Lucifer is a shining one. And in Isaiah 14, he's cast out of heaven. So this must be a reference to the devil. And that's what the early church fathers surmised from this text. Were they wrong? No. No. The early church fathers, many of them were wrong about a lot of things. But they weren't wrong about this. They said, that's the devil. The devil was cast out, Isaiah chapter number 14. And therefore, since it was the devil that was cast out, then his name is Lucifer. Now think about it for a minute before we go further. I don't want to, try, I don't want to confuse you, but I want you to think. When we open the Bible, the Bible is a book of revelation. Revelation is something that is not learned by experience. You can't find it out on your own. Revelation must come from God. This is why the Apostle Paul is so important because all of these mysteries that were revealed to him and the mysteries as they pertain to the body of Christ and God's purpose in Christ in the ages to come. So a revelation is something that comes only from God. So it's a remarkable thing that, uh, that Jerome in 400, 405, whenever it was that he came out with this Latin Vulgate, he used the term Lucifer in translating Hillel, and it only showed up one time in the whole Bible, and only one time in the whole Bible does the word Lucifer show up. And the early church fathers accepted that to mean this is the devil when he was cast out of heaven. And the Lord Jesus was making reference to this when he said, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So therefore, Satan and Lucifer are synonymous with the same uh, individual. And they're right, and I agree with that. Fully agree with that. I believe that Lucifer is a term for Satan. Now, if it's not, if it's not a reference to Satan, who is it a reference to? Let's take, for example, a simple question. How many of you in this house this morning really believe that a reference to Lucifer reaches far past the king of Babylon, and we're talking about something greater than the king of Babylon? Amen. All right, immediately then, that demands the question, well, if therefore it's not talking about the king of Babylon, who is it talking about? If, you'd, if you say, well, now I don't believe it's the devil, then who is it? All right. You remember when we got into Gnosticism, and I told you this is very important to understand this, because the apostle in Colossians chapter number 2 deals directly with some of the basic Gnostic fundamental beliefs. Today, they're preaching this garbage. There's a book that has just recently come out called The Lost Gospels. Uh, Dan Brown has made millions off of, the, off of the idea of Gnosticism, of the lost Gospels. Elaine Pagels wrote books about it, and she's a professor in, in, in some college here in the country, about the Gnostic Gospels and about the hidden gnosis or the hidden knowledge, you see, the knowledge that we need. We don't need to be saved. We need to know. Sa exactly. Salvation is not about sin. Salvation is about knowledge. Man has been bound up, closed in, and, and darkened by the God of the Old Testament, who is a demiurge. So let's go back for a moment, just quickly, and let's look at the basic Gnostic belief. There is a monad, or there is a pleroma, or there is the one. There is that eternal spirit, that is that however they want to define it, and who is unknowable except through emanations. An emanation is something that comes forth from that spirit and that has communicated with mankind. Three basic emanations. One is the Christ spirit, the Christos. Now remember, this is important. Not the Lord Jesus Christ personally, but the Christ spirit. Let me give you a red flag this morning. Big red flag. 
Anytime you're reading any commentary or any com commenter or whoever preacher or listening to anybody, and they're no longer talking about the person of Christ the man, but they're talking about the Christ spirit all the time, you got yourself a heretic first class. All right, now you've got the Christ spirit. That means anointing. Then you have the spirit of wisdom. That is the Sophia. That's what the word means. Sophia, and it's in the feminine gender. You have, therefore, the anointing, you have the wisdom, and then what is left? The light. And so, therefore, who is the light? Who would you think the light would be? Now, being, now it's kind of a catchy thing. Who do you know the light to be? Christ. But, it, but, but with them, Lucifer. All right. So now you have anointing, you have wisdom, you have light. These are emanations from that spirit, that pleroma, that monad, Plato's monad. You've got the spirit, you've got all this, and this emanation, this is a coming forth from, you've got anointing, wisdom, and light. So what's that done with Lucifer? What's, where's that put him? That puts him right up there with the Christ and with wisdom. And this, folks, now, make no mistake about this. You, this needs to be nailed down in your soul. These people believe this stuff. And these people that believe this stuff, they may never refer to themselves as Luciferian. And, they might, and a lot of these people might be highly offended if you call them Luciferian. And when you get into the Illuminati, you get into these movers and shakers, the people... Uh, for, the, for example, a lot of the presidents come and go, and they are the puppet on the end of the string. The one pulling the strings is the one that you need to be concerned about. And what's going on is a one-world conspiracy by people who want a one-world government who absolutely believe that they are better than you. And you just heard a little bit of that from this professor from MIT who was one of the architects of Obamacare. Uh, Fox News has played at, uh, at least five or six or seven different little video clips of him talking about the fact that he was obviously instrumental, paid $400,000 $400, plus. He was one of the architects. He's the one who, who created the nuts and bolts of Obamacare. And he came out publicly and stated how that the American public are stupid. The people are stupid. And so therefore, we're going, to have to, we're going to have to present Obamacare with subterfuge, lying, and that's exactly what they did. If you want to keep your doctor, you can keep your doctor. You know what I mean. That has, that has become a cliche in America and will forever because it was one of the most bald-faced lies you ever heard in your life. Right. And it's proven to be so. But the point is, it was designed like that from the beginning. And they knew it. <clears throat> they knew most Americans are satisfied with their little world that they live in, and they're not really concerned about what's going on outside that world. And so this, uh, this, this, this issue of Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, I think is the official title of it, presented with lies, and now people are beginning to wake up, and people are realizing what's happening. Now let's get on past that. They don't have enough time for Obamacare. But the bottom line is, the person, the, the, this, this idea, this mindset of this professor at MIT, the mindset, I am smarter than you. I know what you need, whether you like it or not. We are going to tell you how to live. We are going to design the future for you. And you might as well just buckle under and get used to it because that's who we are. And we are tapped into a higher source of knowledge than you. We get our knowledge from above. You get your knowledge from the Bible. The Bible, according to the Gnostics and according to the Luciferians, is an inferior book written by prophets of a demiurge who was a created God who created archons underneath him, angels, demons, so forth, to do his will. And so therefore, uh, it was a product of an inferior God with inferior knowledge. And he was a petty tribal God, the God of Israel. And all this stuff you read about Jehovah the Old Testament is about some backwoods God that had no concept of the real light. So you've got to get around this God. And the only way to get around this God to get to that light is to get you a spirit guide. And once you've got yourself a spirit guide, you know, a channeler, and on and on and on it goes, 
uh, once you get yourself a spirit guide, then you can bypass this Old Testament God and plug into the eternal gnosis, the knowledge. And this knowledge is what makes man free. So the Old Testament God wants to bind you up and He uses the idea of sin. They hate the cross. They hate the blood. They hate the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. They may talk in glowing terms about the Christ, but they don't like the man. And they hate all this. They hate the idea of redemption. These are things, and you can, folks, these are the kind of things that are red flags that pop up just like that. You start talking to one of these, thi one of these uh, things, <laughs> one, of, one, of the, one of these people, and you're going to find out real fast the, the idea of semantics. He says red, I say red, but red to him is not red to me. He says up, I say up, up to him is not up to me. Another Jesus. I say Jesus. He says Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. Well, I love Jesus too. Who is your Jesus? His Jesus is not my Jesus. That's the kind of thing you get into. Why? They like to play with your mind. The whole idea is I know so much more than you do. Therefore, I can manipulate your thinking and control you. And that's exactly what they're doing today. They'll get up in the pulpit and claim to be a Christian and hate the man Christ Jesus in their heart. And that's exactly what you're getting from a lot of the professors today and, and politicians and so forth. So in any event, Isaiah talks about Lucifer. <coughs> Lucifer in the world outside the Bible, outside the Bible, Lucifer is a good thing. And he's the source of light. He's the one who came to make men free. How so? Who showed up in Genesis and said to the woman, God doth know, this demiurge doth know that the day that you eat of this fruit, what? You're going to be as gods. Which direction does every man look when he wants to know something? Does he look down or does he look up? It's just natural for him to look up. Why are the scientists today who are abandoning evolution, and they are abandoning evolution by the droves. Why are they talking about being star children? Why do you hear so much of this stuff about, uh, uh, what's that word? Trans transpermia. Why is it so much that you hear this stuff about the fact that there is an intelligence up there that put us down here? And they're up there watching us and they're going to come down here and they're going to see how we're progressing. So all the UFOs and all the abductions and all this other stuff is directly connected with what's going on up there. There's an element of truth in it. But what they see and what I see is two different things. All of us came from up there because the spirit in you came from that spirit up there who's the eternal almighty I am. Your body came down from down here, but your life came from up there. There's nothing on this earth that produces life. Everything on this earth that produces life, that life came from above. The Creator brought it into existence. So it all came from above. So you give, the man an, you give a man an element of the truth, and therefore you can hook him in. I was on a website yesterday and read what this guy had to say, and he's very good. About 98% real good till he got into the Lord Jesus. And he was good about the anointing of Christ. But then he began to sway, and I could see what direction he was taking the people. <clears throat> but the way they do it, they suck you in, and if you don't know the Bible and you don't have a foundation, they've got you hooked. And so your faith is no longer in what the man says, your faith is in the man. And that's what's wrong with most people today. They identify with a movement, with a political philosophy, they identify with a thing, and, but they don't identify with the facts. This is why this fellow called Waters goes out on the street all the time on Fox, and this is not pumping Fox up. But he goes out there and he, he interviews these people. These are voters, and they're as dumb as a coal bucket. But they vote. And that's the sad thing. That's what's going on. And the sad thing is, that's what's going on inside the church house. That's even sadder. That's killing us. For he said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now there is a conflict in this world, the Luciferian, and say, so what is that conflict? Lucifer and Satan. You'll find that many Luciferians do not believe that Satan exists. They are enraged when you, as a Christian, speak of Lucifer and Satan 
in the same tone, synonymously. They're the same. Lucifer is Satan. Satan is Lucifer. I believe that. I know I'm making them mad. I believe it according to the Scripture. But they don't. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them believe that Satan is nothing in the world more than a principle. It's an opposing principle of the yin-yang. Now, you've seen the yin-yang. You know the yin-yang. It's, uh, for example, the flag of, uh, of South Korea. Now, I don't know if it's the only one, but I know for certain that the flag of South Korea has the yin-yang on it. What is it? Male, female. Dark, white. Good, evil. You've got the principle all involved in one circle which completes the whole, but in it are two completely opposed and separate things. Now this is what you've got with Satan and Lucifer. You've got a yin-yang. Say, so why is that important to me? Because from the good, bad, and uh, the two opposing parts, you produce the whole. There can never be a whole, there can never be a syncretism without the two opposing parts that are eventually brought together. It's like thesis, antithesis or antithesis, and then what do you get? Synthesis. The new world order, I hope you're following me, the movers and shakers of this planet create wars on both sides, create chaos, and out of chaos comes synthesis. They present a thesis, People can't accept that. They present a thesis they don't want. Then they present an antithesis or an antithesis to it. And they certainly don't want that, but they're willing to compromise on the thesis. And what happens is they come together and produce a synthesis. And that, therefore, is their goal. It produces what they intend to get. They intend to have a new world order. And if they have to raise up ISIS, if they have whatever they have to do to do it, they'll do it until the people are willing to say, give us peace, give us what, we, give us, we have to have it, and we're willing to do whatever you want us to do. And from that comes the synthesis. Now, there's a place in Arizona called Phoenix, Arizona. I did a little research into that place out there. It was started by one man back in the 1800s. Hard to believe. One man. And this one man... Uh, through, through time, uh, the place began to build because of his presence and what he offered the people, and this and that and so forth and so on, until it eventually became a town, a town that grew and had about at least five, four, five or six different names until they, f they wanted to name it after this man. But then finally they wound up naming it Phoenix. Now Phoenix is the mythological bird. Phoenix is the bird that was died or put to death, or however it came into it came into uh, it came to an end, but then it was raised up again. It was resurrected. It was brought back. It came back, and that's what the phoenix is about. It's about coming out of chaos. It's about order out of chaos. The whole philosophy of the New Age movement, which is one of the arms of the Illuminati which is the arm of the Luciferians, which is the arm of the ruling elite. And let me tell you this before I go any further. You can read every book until you've got to you, uh, on the internet until your eyeballs pop out. There's enough stuff on there to keep you busy for the next 2,000 years. If you read everything that's on the internet that's available about, about all this stuff, you'd spend your whole life reading this stuff. It's an impossibility. It's just overwhelming at the magnitude of the stuff available. But the bottom line is, there is a simple purpose behind all of this, and that is that they're going to rule this world. They're going to rule it. And they are at the point now where they're about ready to take what they intended to take through all this time, and it is order out of chaos. So they want chaos. They want, they want wars, and they want people at each other's throat, and they agitate these wars, and then order comes out of chaos. To do your own study, would be a good study is to go back to World War II after the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 when Germany signed away its, its birthright essentially. The Allies forced them into a signature. The armistice was in 1918, but the, but, the, but the Treaty of Versailles was in 1919. And it was done inside a, in, inside a, a French uh, road car. And, 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 and Germany went into a horrible period economically but if you go back and you look at the building of Germany and go back and look at where the money came from in Germany, you'll find out that the money that came into Germany that rebuilt that country, a lot of that money came from America. 
It came from investors. And these people were financing on both sides what was going on in that horrible war in World War II. And they brought this man to where he is. Hitler could have never done what he did without money, folks. You don't build, he had an army at one time, probably five to six million men. He, three, he sent three million men into Russia in uh, Operation Barbarossa. Three million men. Three million from that little old country over there in Germany. So he had millions of men in an army. Who, who, who financed all that? Who paid for all of that? You got to have money. These people are infinitely wealthy and they'll do exactly what they intend to do. What are they? They're Luciferians. They believe that they have a knowledge that you don't have. They're, they're tapped into a wisdom that you don't have, that they have the Christ on them, that anointing that you don't have, and that you are dealing with an inferior God, with an inferior Bible. And so therefore, they're just going to treat you like the herd, like the, like, like the crowd. And that's, that's their idea. That's the way they see you. That's a problem that we need to deal with. Because if you study your Bible, you find out that... Uh, uh, you find out that there is a reality to this. I'm going to read something here that some of these people have said in the past. Uh, let's get on over here, and I'm going to read what he says, and then I'm going to let you think of who said this. Here's a good quote. The dunces who led primitive Christianity astray. Now, who is that? That's the church fathers. By substituting faith for science, reverie for experience, the fantastic for the reality, and the inquisitors who for so many ages waged against magism, a war of extermination, have succeeded in shrouding in darkness the ancient discoveries of the human mind, so that we now grope in the dark to find again the key of the phenomena of nature. Another one said, Lucifer is the equal of Adonai. With Lucifer, the God of light and goodness, struggle for humanity against Adonai, the God of darkness and evil. See how it's completely turned? This man had only specified and unveiled dogmas of the high grades of all other, for no matter was right. The great architect of the universe is not the God worshipped by the Christians. Let's go on. And I want you to hear this. I want you to hear the arrogance. Here it is. July the 14th, 1889, two years before his death. Quote, That which we must say to the crowd, that's you and me, I'm part of the crowd, is we worship a God, but it is the God one adores without superstition. We say this, that you may repeat it to the brethren. By all of us initiates of the high degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. If Lucifer were not God, for Adonai, the Hebrew word for Lord, which refers to Yahweh, the God of Israel, whose name they avoided using, whose deeds prove his cruelty, perfidy, perfidity, and hatred of man, barbarism and requisition for science, repulsion for science. Would Adonai, Adonai and his priest calumniate him? Yes, Satan, yes, Lucifer is God, and unfortunately Adonai is also God. Yin Yang? Okay, now watch this. For the eternal law is that there is no light without shade, no beauty without ugliness, no white without black. For the absolute can only exist as two gods, darkness being necessary to light to serve as its foil, as the pedestal is necessary to the statue, the brake to the locomotive. Thus the doctrine of Satan is a heresy, and the true and pure philosophic religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai, but Lucifer... God of light, God of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the God of darkness and evil. Now, who's Adonai? In the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, when the Hebrew was reading his Bible, 
he would come to yod Hey val Hey, the Tetragrammaton, and he would never read it, yod Hey val Hey. He would replace it with the word Adonai, which means Lord. yod Hey val Hey is the ineffable name of God. That is God's name. Now we translate it, the Masoretes put vowel points on it, about 11, 12, 1300 A.D., somewhere in there. They put vowel points on it, and we pronounce it Yehovah, in English, Jehovah. You're pronouncing yod Hey vowel Hey the Tetragrammaton. You're pronouncing it because of what the Masoretes gave you. These are four consonants. There is no way that an Englishman or anybody else would have any idea how to pronounce that word without vowels because it's all consonants. All consonants. You've got to have a vowel. And so without the vowel, we're at a loss. So therefore, unsaved Jews, and most Christians don't know this, but they need to know this, unsaved Jews, I think it's 1100 and something A.D., put the Masoretic vowel points on yod Hey vowel Hey, and we pronounce it Jehovah. Now today there's a big dog fight about the fact that they say, well, yod Hey vowel Hey with the Masoretic vowel points, they just took it from Adonai, and they put those vowel points on it, and it should be pronounced Yahweh. Now, how many of you have heard the Yahweh? All right, that's where it comes from. It comes from the big dog fight between one group of Christians says it's Jehovah, another group of Christians says it's Yahweh. Can you go to heaven saying Yahweh? Yes. Yes. Can you go to heaven saying Jehovah? Yes. What keeps you out of heaven? He that hath the Son hath life. Amen. He that hath not the Son hath not life. Amen. You can be wrong on some of your doctrine and still go to heaven. Right. You be wrong on Christ and heaven is shut to you. <coughs> There's no other way. So this is what he's talking about. This is what this man's talking about. He is saying, Adonai, yod heh vau -Hey, Demiurge, God of the Old Testament, and Lucifer are pitted one against the other, and inside this circle, one against the other, I make my choice of, not Adonai, my choice is Lucifer, because Lucifer is the God of light, the God of freedom. He gives me knowledge. The knowledge makes me free. And so therefore, I'm going to choose him. And by choosing him, I've been made free. I'm an initiate. I'm an adept, whatever they want to call themselves. And I am therefore better than you, greater than you, know so much more than you do. And therefore, I'm going to control your life. I'm going to tell you how to live. I won't tell you openly, publicly. No, I'll take care of the laws. A smart man said to me one time, he said, you understand, of course, don't you, that rich men write the laws. Now go home and think about that. It's just like the victors write the history books. Well, the rich men write the laws. Did anybody consult with you when they wrote up Obamacare? <laughs> Nobody ever called you up, did they? You know why? Because that thing was formulated by these people up here that pull the strings. All right? And that's exactly what they're going to do. They'll make the country into a socialistic, communistic, nation of people dependent upon the government, instead of taking your individuality, they want your individuality gone. They want your individual identity gone. They want you to identify as a global citizen. When you, when, when you identify yourself as an individual, this nation was built by individuals, by pioneers, by people who went out and rolled up their sleeves and went to work and were not dependent upon the government. That's what made America great. But to people today, they run to the polls and they vote because the, vote, because the government is going to take care of them from cradle to grave. You understand what I'm saying? That's the mindset that's going on in this nation. So this man said, what you say to the crowd is. Now what does that imply to you? What's that mean? What you say to the crowd is. For public consumption. The bottom line is you can't believe them. You can't believe these people. He says, I believe in Jesus. He doesn't believe in Jesus. He says, I'm a Christian. He's not a Christian. Because the very basis of their whole religion and philosophy is that I'm smarter than you. Yes, Lucifer is God. But I choose Lucifer, the God of light, against the God of darkness. Now, who do you think said that? That's right, Pike. Albert Pike, 1889, July the 14th, two years, 
before he died, he said that. And he, of course, is the one who wrote the Morals and Dogma, uh, the Masonic Lodge, and the, uh, and the Masons revere him as their, as their mentor and their teacher and, uh, and the one who, uh, who has laid the foundation uh, for their faith. Listen to this. What is more absurd and more impious than to attribute the name of Lucifer to the devil? That is, to pers that is to personify evil. The intellectual Lucifer is the spirit of intelligence and love. It is the paraclete. It is the Holy Spirit. While the physical Lucifer is the great agent of universal magnetism. Now you know for sure a Christian didn't say that. No, a Christian would never say that. Even if a Christian didn't, have, <laughs> didn't know a whole lot about Lucifer, he wouldn't say that. Why, would, why wouldn't he say that? Because he would, make those, he would say that in reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, not Lucifer. That's what's going on. Yes, sir. All right, now, all right, now what this brother says is good, and it says two things. It's very important to understand. Two things. Number one, the Jews got it wrong when they put the Masoretic vowel points on there, and we pronounce it Jehovah. And who wrote that Bible? Jews. But number two, identifies Yahweh. Once you make him Yahweh or Yahweh, then now you've connected him with this occult Luciferian world that we're talking about and taking his unique identity away from him. Yep. That yod hey vow hey, the tetragrammaton, is a very important thing. Until we had one show up that God gave a name which is above every name. Amen. And there's no doubt in it in my mind, and nor have I ever seen it, the doubt of any of a Christian's mind. Right. When you say that name, you're talking about Almighty God. Amen. What is that name, by the way? Jesus. Say it as much as you can in this house, Amen. and you'll make the devil mad. Amen. Yes, ma'am. The Israelites going into captivity for 70 years. Yeah. Uh -huh. Say again now. 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. It's called 400 silent years. Called that now. Absolutely. That's what the Talmud's all about. The Babylonian Talmud is a product of the 70 years and longer because then instead of coming back to their land, God said, come back to the land. They stayed in Babylon because they were prospering in Babylon. And, uh, but what happened is that the, that the occult world of Babylon, the uh, Luciferian world of Babylon, got brought into what became the Talmud. And so now when you talk to a Jew about the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he, he doesn't he doesn't care what the book says. He opens his Talmud. Same thing. Oh, yeah. Now, I've seen when you get into Judaism, there's a group called Kairite. Kairite Jews. K-A-I-R-I-T-E. A Kairite Jew rejects the Babylonian Talmud and they reject Rabbinic Judaism. Okay? That is a door open. That means that a Kairite Jew only, re only recognizes Genesis through Malachi. And that's good. <laughs> because you can show them how Christ is God in the book of Zechariah, the, the Bible. Yeah. Here's the problem. When you get into the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, you have a codified system. The Babylonian Talmud does not come out and say, Jesus is a devil. 
but it uses different names to identify Him. And they train their children from an early age what these names are, who they represent, who they've been, uh, been, uh, uh, been in Hebrews, son of, uh, Ben Pantera, all right, is found in the Talmud. And it's supposed to make a reference, it's supposed to be a reference to Pantera, a Roman soldier. Okay, so this is the son of a Roman soldier. But they teach their children that Ben Pantera is Jesus, that he's the son of a Roman soldier. Now, why did they do this? They do this because Gentiles like us, if we open up the Talmud and we start reading through the Babylonian Talmud and we don't find the name Jesus in there, we turn around and say, well, I don't see anything about Jesus in the Talmud. They're not throwing off on him. Oh, yes, they are. Yes, sir. They say he's boiled in his own excrement, that he's in hell fire, and all kinds of things about him, but they use their own codified system that they teach their children orally. Oral. They do. They do. And that's very important. That's very important uh, that you understand that. That's just why this, uh, this um, who's this, uh, this uh, prophet uh, Nostradamus, that his books are called Quatrains. All right, when Nostradamus was writing, he was writing when they were burning people at the stake. Okay? So he wanted to be certain that what he wrote was, 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 was couched in, in, in uh, uh, cryptic terminology. I guess is the best way to put it. Cryptic terminology. And so only the initiate would understand what he's talking about. He could get his message across, but he couldn't, he wouldn't be openly condemned. We've done run out of time. It's, uh... Hey, brother. No, it's finished. But what they do, they keep interpreting it. You've got halakha, and uh, halakha is the halakha, or halakha is the rabbinic interpretation of the codified law of righteousness. So if something has been deemed a certain thing under halakha, it means that it's wrong. So it's left up to the rabbis to do that. Mammonides was one of the smartest brains that ever had anything to do with the Talmud. He was a, he was a Spaniard doctor. That was who converted to Christianity, quote unquote, never became a Christian, but he did that to keep from dying, and he codified the Talmud. You want something on adultery? It's found here. You want something on sacrifices? It's found here. See what I mean? Mammonides did that. And so the Talmud was a product of, of growth, but it was, it, as far as, as anything I've ever read about the Talmud, they're not still writing the Talmud, but they're still interpreting it. The ter in, in other words, the interpretation is open for discussion. So how do I see the Talmud in 2014? So you saw it in 1950 like that, but how do I see it today? That kind of thing. You know, that's the way the Bible is too, by the way. A lot of Christians are like that. Well, I know it meant that in 1960, but what's it mean now? Well, you better believe it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what the Bible becomes like that is relative. Yep. Relative truth is no truth at all. And, uh, but anyway, we'll pick it up again next week. I didn't even get into Gail Ripplinger. She's got some good stuff in here. Gail Ripplinger is something else. How many's ever heard of Gail Ripplinger? You ever seen her book, The New Age Bible Versions? Yep. Boy, you talk about people gnashing at the teeth. Some of, the, some of the great Bible prophecy teachers in America, when they were presented with this, uh, with this uh, work, uh, I forget when it was written, about in the 80s or 90s, somewhere back in there, uh, one, one asked one of the great Bible prophecy teachers in America, said, uh, said, what do you think about Gail Ripplinger's book on the New Age Bible? He said, I despise. He said, that's a piece of junk. Have you read it? No, I haven't read it. I don't need to read it. <laughs> that's the idea. That's the idea. <laughs> Brother Lee, will you dismiss us?